right? All right, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Lord, because every time I see Jesus, I'm reminded of how much you love us. I'm reminded of everything you've given to us because you want us in your kingdom. And Lord, I just want to pray that our hearts will respond to that. I want to pray again that for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the prayer. But Lord, I want to accept that prayer, Lord, and accept the grace of your spirit to work upon our hearts, mine included. Lord, we ask for your blessing and your gift. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's testimony is one that um, is a little difficult for me to share, but I do pray that you see the goodness of God in it, and I do pray that we'll understand how to know God even in this experience. If you have your Bible, I'm asking you to go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30, and we're going to begin at verse 1. This is Samuel's, Samuel's experience in... Um, not sorry, I'm sorry, not Samuel, David's experience, and he was in Ziklag, and we're going to begin in verse 1, um, notice what the Bible says, First uh, Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse 1, are we there? Amen. Amen. And the Bible says, and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Zik Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag and smitten Ziglag and burn it with fire. This is David's men. They're staying in Ziglag at this time. Uh, they actually, David ran from running from Saul. He started to kind of take things in his own hands. He ends up in Ziglag uh, trying to get safety from the Philistines. And they actually gave him this city. So this is where David is. He's going outside of God's will in being here. And the Bible continues, it says, uh, so his Ziglag is now taken while they were away. And verse 2 says, and had, uh, or the Am Am Amalekites come, and it says, and had taken the women captives that, therein, that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and his people were with, that were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. This is serious crime. They're weeping till they have no more power to weep. Didn't stop there. In verse 5 it says, And David's two wives were taken captives. I had known know the Jezreelites. And Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, and every man for his sons and for his daughters. And it says, But David encouraged himself in, his Lord, in the Lord his God. You know, this is an interesting story because when you really think about it, it's a, it amazes me that David would encourage himself in the Lord his God because, first of all, this was a lot to be discouraged about. His wife and his, his two wives are taken. They're taken away. And not only are his two wives, he's devoid of his two wives, but his own men, his closest friends, want to stone him. But when you really think about it, I think the thing that would have gotten me the most is that the reason why he was in the place was not because he was following God's will. It would have been easy for him to think like, has God left me? And he's in this place. But yet the Bible says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. The testimony I want to share with you um, this morning is kind of, it's not necessarily based on this verse, but God used this passage of scripture to encourage me in one of the darkest the, the toughest situations of my life. And I want to share with you how God used this passage of Scripture. It was some years ago, and I was canvassing. It was a, I, I want to say it was a winter program, I can't remember. But I was canvassing in, I believe this town is called Minden, or, or Meridian, Mississippi. And my good friend Jensen was actually there. He was our, our head leader, and I was his co-leader. Don't do that. 
That's what I thought. <laughs> we'll talk afterwards. Um, but we were there, and, um, and we, we, we were, we, there was a number of us. It was a small one-band team. And we had a, a gentleman with us. It was all college students, but we had one young man that was with us that was not a college student. And he was not even necessarily of college age. He was still in, a, in academy age. And I can remember him being there, and I know that others may have thought the same thing that I was thinking. You know what? It's tough being a, a younger student amongst all these college students. So I'm sure all of us in all our, our, our unique ways was trying to reach out to him. Um, his mother had wanted him to be there, it's my understanding, after talking to him. And he was kind of wanting to be there, but he wasn't his, you know, his spiritual life. He was going through this situation where he was sort of... Um, deciding, struggling, There's, just like we all do. We all have those struggles in our heart. <clears throat> and so I was thinking, I know my unique way, I was like, you know what, I really want to get close to him. I want to see what are some of the things he likes, you know, outside of work. We can go, you know, we didn't have too much to do, but we just, we'll just talk, we'll go do something exciting, exercise, whatever. That was my way of, unique way of reaching out to him. And so we did. We started to get kind of close and you know, I started to re realize why he was there and some of the things he would share with me, some of the struggles he had, and he really wanted a relationship with God. <clears throat> and this went on for a little while, and it was up and down. You know how it is with, with canvassing. It was up and down. And, um, and I can remember, um, as this time went on, it seems like for a moment that it was like, wow, it's just really, it's kind of going south here, you know, spiritually. But nevertheless, we kept this relationship. We had this open um, communication. Well, I remember, we're going to fast forward for the sake of time, I remember this one specific, I think it was the evening, he asked me the question, he said, you know what, I really want to have my devotions, because he hadn't been, since he had been there, sometimes campus can be a little rigorous, and, and sometimes it's easy for us, like, oh, I'm just going to sleep in, you know, I need that sleep, right? But he said, I really want to have my devotions, uh, will, you, will you help me, will you wake me up? And I was like, sure. I was like, I'll, I'll wake you up. I'll do whatever I can to, you know, help someone have that time with God. And so, um, the, and we may have talked about some other things. Anyway, that morning, I woke him up, and sure enough, he got up. I was like, praise the Lord. He, just, he really wants this. He really wants, and I was praying for him, and he had his devotions. And after he had his devotions, we started to talk about what our devotions was, was about. And guess what? It was sweet. It was beautiful. Like, you know, all the, the, I mean, before that, it looks like he was going south here, but then he had this moment where he had his devotion. He was like, wow, it was good, and, you know, we were talking about it, and then we started talking about other things. We started talking about ministry. He started talking about how his mom was in ministry, and then he said something interesting. We were, you know, the day was about to go on, and, and you know, we have to kind of get going, but he says, um, you know what? You really should talk to my mom. You really should get, get involved or, or see, check out their ministry. Can I give you her cell phone number? And I was thinking to myself, I was like, yeah, yeah, that would be great. I would love to do it. I said, you know what? Boy, we, we've been talking for a while, so we have to get ready. So I was like, I made this tonight, let me get it tonight. And then he was like, okay, sure, no problem. But later on, I was, I was trying to get dressed. And I was like, you know what? Let me go ahead and get it now. So I go back. I was like, you know what? I said I was going to get it tonight, but let me go ahead and get it now. Let me put it in my phone right now, and that way I'll just have it, because who knows? I might forget tonight. So he's like, all right, Sure. He gave it to me. That particular day, and I'm not sure how we set it up, but I remember Jensen said I was going to be leaving that day. I wasn't necessarily wanting to leave that day. I didn't tell him that, but I wasn't necessarily wanting to leave that day, but I was like, you know what? I'll do it. This means I have to take extra prayer because now I want to do something. I'm, I'm asked to do something that I didn't feel like I wanted to do it. Didn't feel like it. So I had to have extra prayer. The day went on. The day wasn't too bad. The morning goes. Uh, I can't remember exactly what all happened that day. You know, I don't. I can't remember. But I just remember for for this for this young man, he wasn't having the the greatest day, uh, as far as like when we think about sales and all that kind of stuff. It was kind of a slow day for him. And yet I was trying to encourage him. And there was another young lady. She was trying to encourage him. And you know, he just wasn't having the the, the fastest day. I guess that's another way to put it. And so around lunchtime, we, we sit in the, um, in, um, we, sat, we brought our own food, but we sat in the restaurant. They let us do that. And we were still talking. I could tell he sounded a little bit negative. I was like, okay, well, 
you know, hey, it's going to get better. You know, you, whatever we try to do as leaders to try to encourage students. And so I decided I kind of want to drop him off as one of the, the last students to drop off. I'm going to drop everyone else off. I drop everyone else off. And for some reason, I dropped him off before I dropped one of the other young ladies off. So I dropped him off, and I was just going to have them meet. And then I went to drop her off. And when I went to drop her off, I think she might have asked me, can I be last? And, um, you know, you don't always accept that, but there was something she wanted to talk to me about. And so I'm in the, in the van. I was like, okay. And, and when she gets out, she's like, you know what? I have this real, real burden for this young man. I want to be last because I want to pray for him. And I was like, wow, I've been having that same burden too. So we were in the van. We prayed for him together. We prayed for this young man. And that was it. Dropped her, dropped her off. You know, occasionally as leaders, you go and you check on various students. You go and check on some other students. And um, they were there for more, most of the, the after lunch time. And then um, the time came where I, I, I moved some students. I moved a couple of students to a certain area. It was starting to get late, so I moved them. And while I was moving them, I knew, I was like, wow, I'm starting to move territory. So you know how sometimes as leaders that can be challenging because if you're going to move territory, you, you're almost like you're out of range. I said, I don't want to get out of range too much. So I was trying to make sure I'm doing this quickly. And I'm moving territory. And I just dropped off one group of students. I'm dropping off the other group of students. And I'm moving this territory. And while I'm there, I hear over my radio, I could barely hear it because I'm starting to get out of range, but I could barely hear someone calls me for management assistance. And I was thinking to myself, oh, man. This is an officer, okay, and every time I have an officer, I'm always praying, okay, Lord, give me the right words to speak, help me to stay calm, don't let it look like I'm nervous, you know, all the, so some of you leaders know what I'm talking about, so I'm praying, that's like management assistance, you know, so I'm getting over, that's like, okay, this is my next stop, I just want to make sure that I get to them, who knows, um, you know, what's going on, what I need to talk to them about, and I'm making my way over, and then when I get to their street, the street's crowded. People are all in the street. And I think to myself, oh, man, I'm trying to get to them. Management assistance, they're probably talking to an officer. I hope he's a kind one. I hope he's not impatient. And now I got this group of people in the middle of the street. How am I going to get to them? And just then when I was thinking that, it was like an impression came on my mind. This is your management assistance. And I was like, Lord, what does that mean? And then I paused right there, I kind of pulled up, and I, I sat there, and I was kind of, you know, surveying the area. And just as I noticed, I noticed from my right, there were canvassing books all over the ground. And then I kind of looked to right in front of me, and there was the, one of the student, one of um, the, the girl student that I had been praying with, I prayed with before I dropped her off. There she was, she was, she was kneeling down on the ground, and... I guess she saw my van. She looked up and looked at me, and I can remember looking at her, and her eyes said everything, said everything. I could tell it's like she wasn't crying, but she wanted to cry. And then I looked in front of her, and there was my student. Something had gone wrong. Off to the side, it was like I saw this yellow Jeep or whatever. It was kind of like off in the ditch, and I'm thinking, like, what's happening? Like, I hop out the van. I run over, I see this lady, she had just gotten off of work, she was a nurse, she's down there, and she's talking to him, she's like, just stay calm, just stay calm, everything's okay, and someone else is like, I saw it all, you know how it is when something's happening, everyone has their version, and everyone's talking, and I literally, I run over, and I look at my student, there he is on the ground, and, you know, he looks like his eyes are in shock, and it looks like his, his legs are, like, uh, distorted, and I just, I almost lose it. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to cry. I didn't know. I was like, I could not think. Someone had hit one of my students with a car. And when you see that, I don't know if you students understand it, but when you are a leader and a student's un in your care, it, it's, it's like they are like your child. I don't know what it's like to have children, but that's the closest thing I, I feel like. Like, they're like your child. It's like something in me. I was just... I, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to lose it. And people say stay calm when you're in, in situations like that. But I tell you, when you're in that situation, your first reaction, you don't know what you do. And I'm, I, I think I'm a pretty calm person, but I almost lost it. I almost was not able to think. And immediately something came to my mind and said, listen, you need to think right now because he needs you now to think more than ever before. 
And so I go over, and this lady, she's a nurse, and she's, she's down there, and, I, and it's like something snaps me back, and she's like, listen, she's like, does anyone know who this young man is? And I'm like, yes, that's, that's my student, and, and you know, so forth, so on. While she's talking, she's trying to calm him down, and people all around on the street, and everyone's talking about what's happening, and suddenly I hear the, the ambulance comes, I hear them in the background, and they get there, and the ambulance comes out, and they say, does anyone know this young man? Like, we want to do... X, Y, Z, but is he allergic to anything? Can anyone tell me, like, is he allergic to anything? Who is his parent? How old is he? And it was like, does anyone have his mother's number? And I was thinking to myself, no one has his mother's number, but then it was like, wait, I just got it that morning. I wasn't going to get it. God impressed me. I was like, I have it. I know who he is. I have his mother's number. And so it's like, can you call his mom? I don't want to go through that whole conversation, but that was the worst conversation. It wasn't bad, but it was the hardest. Let me just use that phrase. It was the hardest conversation I ever had in my, to have, have in my life. To tell a mom five hours away that her son was, in my mind at the time, fighting for his life. That was very tough. But she was so calm. She was like, so what's happening? Okay. She's like, I did not hear a cry in her voice. She was like, God is in control. I'm on my way. I was like, wow. Meanwhile, they're working with them, and, you know, the police show up and all these different things, and my whole focus is just, is this young man going to be okay? They take him in the ambulance, and then I know my next, I'm, I'm like, okay, give me information. Where is, he, uh, where is he going? All this information, everything I could think to get at the time. And then I knew I need to go gather the other students, and my first thought is I'm going to go to the hospital, and maybe I'll let Jensen take everyone else home. But of course, I don't think anyone else want to go home either, right? And so we get all this information. We're headed to the hospital. There are probably some other things I'm probably leaving out for the, for the sake of time or just I can't remember. But I remember getting to the hospital, and I was like, I was still really nervous. I was still just, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what his condition was. And I couldn't sit down, and I don't know how others felt, but I remember just pacing back and forth. God, what's going on? Like, why did, they, like, just praying to God not knowing what's happening, and eventually there was, the ambulance came out, and thankfully they were Christians. They said, can we pray with you? And that was a little bit encouraging, but still it just seemed like it wasn't enough, right? And I was just, Lord, you know. And finally, we had a message. I may be getting some of this information. You may be able to help me with this, but some of this information I may not get straight, but I remember someone coming out to us and saying, listen, we're going to have to lifeline him to, I believe it was Birmingham, Alabama. They said, we don't have what we necessarily need here. We're going to have to, to, to fly him out. So in my mind, I'm thinking, this is not good. This is really not good. But I said, you know what? I'm going to be there. First thing I knew, I had a cousin in Birmingham. I call her up. I was like, look, it's possible I might be coming down there tonight. I'm going to be flying. I was like, could you have a room ready? She was like, sure, whatever you need. And I was like, wow. I was like, this doesn't sound good. So I'm praying. And I'm like, Lord, you know, like, I don't know if I could take this. And then... We were there for a little while, and then someone came out and said, um, well, I have news for you. We're not going to lifeline him or fly him out. And I'm thinking, like, yes. They said, he's not stable enough for that. <sighs> like, this is not, this is, this is worse than what I was expecting. Um, so then we start praying. They, they, I think they, like, sedated him and different things. And so we asked, can we go pray with them before they, they were going to try to do, like, an emergency surgery uh, something of that nature. So he said, can we go pray with him? So I said, sure, you can come in and pray with us, and, and pray with him. We saw him, and we stood around the, the, the bed. He was, of course, he didn't realize we were there. We prayed for him. And then, um, I don't know if all the rest of the students went home, but I knew I was going to stay there. I was going to stay there. There was phone calls I had to make, of course. Uh, I think I contacted Ms. Magda, I guess. And there was different things that had to happen. Um, but the pressure, and I had many people calling in. It was like within minutes, people were calling in. How is he doing? What's this going on? You know, how are the other students doing? Who was the student that was there? There was so many questions, and I'm trying to, you know, logically answer some of them. There were some phone calls. I was like, well, I'll just probably have to talk to them later because, you know, I don't know if it will really help right now. Uh, but I stayed there, and I was contacting the mother, and the mother, one of the things she contacted me, and I finally got her in contact with the doctor, and she said, um, I asked the doctor, when they go into emergency surgery, 
because they were saying that they were looking at some sort of x-ray or whatever it was, and they said that his spleen was demolished. They said they had to remove the spleen. And she said, I told the doctor, save his spleen. And I was like, wow, she said, please pray to that end. That's why I told the doctor. And I was like, well, what did the doctor say? The doctor said, lady, there's no way we can save this spleen. We're going to have to put a net over it. What are you thinking? There's no way. And um, before they went into surgery, they looked at it again. And then when they came out, when they finally came out, they called the mom. The mom called me. She said, Anthony, you would not believe what just happened. She said, they were telling me that the, the spleen couldn't be saved. They had to put a net over it. It's demolished. There's no way. But she said, when they went in to see, when they opened him up to go do the surgery, they said his spleen looked like it was perfectly fine, like no one touched it. And I knew, I was like, God is working. God is working. <clears throat> Eventually, after many hours, his mom made it. I stayed up just about the, the, the whole night. We had another friend, another uh, young man who used to be a student here, Jonathan, stayed with us just about the whole night. And finally, it was so late, uh, they were like, well, maybe you should go home. I think it was probably morning by this time. I go home, uh, or to the church, and I can't sleep. And I'm just sitting there, and I said, Lord, I've never been at a point where I just, it feels so dark. It feels like, um, like I, I felt guilty. I was the one that put him on that street. I felt like, you know, and maybe people did it, but... I was looking for human affection, and I hadn't heard it yet at that point. So I really felt lonely, dark, guilty, didn't know what to do. I'm responsible for this. I can't sleep. And I prayed, and I prayed, I prayed, and finally, I guess I prayed myself to sleep. I literally cried that night, and I went to sleep. I remember not wanting to get up, because I was like, I was like it's going to be a long day tomorrow. I'm not going to want to, I don't want to get up, but I got up, and I got up at the same time I generally get up to have my devotions, and I had just been sleeping for maybe like two or three hours, and I got up, and Lord directed my mind to this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 30. It was like one of those times your mind is so clouded that, you know, generally you don't want to just like open up and be like, okay, Lord, what should I read? You don't want to do that. But it was like God was merciful to me that he knew my mind was so clouded, and so the first thing I opened up to was this. And I'm reading it, and I'm praying over it. It wasn't a long read, but I was praying over it. And God showed me this story, and I was like, wow, David must have felt lonely like I felt. Not that people were just, like, disowning me, but I was like, you know, David must have felt. I wouldn't have anyone stoning me, praise God. But David must have felt the way that I felt at that moment. And as I kept reading, we already read this passage, but I noticed that the Bible says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. I said, how did David encourage himself in the Lord? How did he do that? So I was really thinking about that, and I was really praying about that, and God starts speaking to me, and then I got to verse 8, and it says, And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, uh, Pursue, for thou shalt overtake them, and without fail, recover all. I know that that verse probably didn't really apply to me necessarily if he was going to talk about hermeneutics and all those different things. But out of all those different things, God said, listen, I just want you to catch this phrase, recover all. I'm going to do it. And I was like, Lord, you're good. That's all I need to hear. I'm ready for the day. And it was like not after, long after that, Miss Magda called me. You know, I was looking for that human sympathy. God wanted me to get sympathy from God first. And I remember Miss Magda called me. She said something that was really encouraging. I was like, Lord, that's like the double encouragement. It's getting ready to go. And got up, went into the, to the, to the little area of fellowship, whatever kitchen we were in. I saw some of the students. And now I was like, I was encouraged enough to, 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 to have a smile on my face. How are you guys doing? You know God's going to work this out. The next day, long story short, the next day we go in. I go to see the mom again. I'm back at the hospital. And they're talking about all these various surgeries they have to do. Um, things have been going well, but they're like, you know what, we have to, uh, one of the final surgeries they had to do was on his legs. They had a, he, he had broken his femur bones. I think they're like the two biggest bones uh, there in the body. And there's like, well, you know, all the blood that they saw was because of these femur bones. They said, we have to replace these. So they had the weights trying to keep his legs apart, uh, weights on the end of his legs. And they said, well, we're going to have this surgery. And the doctor said, um, Boy, there's so much other things to this story. I'm not going to tell it, though, but ask me later. But the doctor said, he said, um, we're going to have this surgery at this certain time. 
And that's what we were planning. He said it takes about, it seemed like it was like a, over an hour to have the surgery. Um, but in the meantime, his mom said, you know, I'm just, she said, praise God. She said, for some reason, I'm just praying that this surgery will be done by Sabbath. And I was like, she said, but if not, this is something that's necessary. But if Lord's will, we'll have it done by Sabbath. And so time went on, and the doctor, he was like, you know what? Can you please, something happened. He had another emergency surgery. He's like, we can't get to it right away. It's Friday, but we can't get to it right away. Time passes. He had something else going on. Time passes. We only have like a short time, um, like an hour or, or I think the surgery was almost like two hours, but he's like, we don't have like a certain amount of time. It was less than the, the amount of time needed. The, the time between that time and Sabbath was less than the time needed to do surgery on him. And I can remember they, come, they came and said, we're going, to, uh, we're going to have surgery on him now. And we was like, well, praise the Lord. You know, it probably goes into Sabbath, but it's something that's needed, right? They, go into, they take him into surgery, and while they're taking him into surgery, I'm sitting there with the mom, uh, his mom, and uh, the, student, the academy student used to go here, but he had graduated. We're all sitting there talking, and we're just talking about the whole situation. We're just praising God, and then she says, she said, um, you know, they haven't talked to me about a bill yet. She says, I'm sure this is going to be quite expensive. I have heard nothing. I have signed. No, they hadn't brought any papers to sign. Nothing. And so she said, I'm a little concerned. So we were like, well, we don't, you know, I don't know what to say about that. Within a short amount of time, the doctor came out, and the doctor said, um, well, the surgery went well. Everything's perfectly fine. You're going to be able to see him soon. It was perfect. And she was like, well, praise the Lord. She said, excuse me, doctor, I have one question. What about this whole thing with the payment? Like, I haven't seen anything. And by the way, she works at a ministry. She's like, I don't know how I pay it, but of course it's my son. She's like, I haven't seen anything. And the doctor said, don't worry about it. The young lady that hit your son, his, her father offered to pay for everything. She was like, wow, praise God. And we were just like, praise the Lord, doctor leaves. And then we start talking again, just praising God. And then she said, wait, guys, do you realize something? There's still five minutes before Sabbath. God had recovered everything. And there was more things that happened after that. But when I look at this experience, I start thinking to myself, why did God let me go through that? Why did God allow me to go through that tough situation in my life? And I started learning some lessons. It's those situations that teach you to trust Jesus when it seems like Jesus isn't there. I think about this thought often. You know, we talked about how Jesus went into the wilderness. And he, he could have felt like God had abandoned him. But God, that was a necessary experience for Jesus. Jesus got the victory over there. And what I want to submit to you this morning is that Jesus, if Jesus didn't get the victory in the wilderness he wouldn't have gotten the victory in the garden. That wilderness experience prepared him for Gethsemane and it prepared him for the cross to the point that Jesus was able to say on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he later says in faith, into thy hands I commend my spirit because Jesus knew there have been moments in my life where I felt like the Father isn't there, but he's always come through. And even though the angels may not come show up to after the tomb, I know they will show up. He still trusted, and that's the same experience God wants us to learn. And so when he puts us through experiences where we feel like it's dark, where we seem like the human, human beings aren't there, we can still trust that God will come through. Then I read this quote. I'm going to close with this quote. This, like, like, sealed it. This is Councils for the Church, page 334. Ellen White says, Oh, for a living active faith. We need it. We must have it, or we shall faint and fail in the day of trial. The darkness, the darkness, I want you to get that, the darkness that will then rest upon our path must not discourage us or drive us to despair. She says, it is the veil with, with which God covers his glory when he comes to impart rich blessings. That's what the darkness is. She continues, and I want us to get this. She says, we should, now, we, should know, we should know this, 
by our past experiences. Wow. When we feel like things are dark, and it's like this trial is just so heavy, she says, you should know that that's not Jesus abandoning you. He's coming close. He's just covering the glory. But how do we know that? She says, by our past experiences. Notice what she says lastly. She says, in that day when God has a controversy with his people, this experience will be a source of comfort and hope. And I thought about that. I said, Lord, if I'm alive at the time of Jacob's trouble, if I'm alive at the time where the plagues are falling on this earth, if God allows me to be alive, when it feels like the time is dark, I believe by God's grace I can look back on Meridian, Mississippi. You say, God was there then, God will be here now. Amen. And God can give that experience to each and every one of us. That's my prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much again for Jesus. I thank you so much that you're with us when the times seem dark and heavy. Lord, I pray that in your mercy you would draw our hearts to you, that we would have faith in you, we'll know that you're there, even when it, our feelings may tell us you're not. Help us to take hold by faith and say with Jesus, into thy hand we commend our spirit. We ask these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so pleased you could join us for this special event here at Washington Hills College and Academy. If you've enjoyed the programs just as much as I did, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you want to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining us. May God richly bless you.